experience, because I think it frames my reasons or the answer is that as a, as a young person in elementary school, um, and really, I guess up until high school, um, I had a learning disability. I had an auditory processing disorder, um, which made it really difficult for me to read. And so I was really quiet in school because I was constantly checking, um, did this make sense? When I was reading, I was the kid who never wanted to be called on to read because I was so nervous, I would mispronounce the words. I had a list. I couldn't say my, my name wasn't Laura, it was Wawa. I couldn't say my brother's name. Um, and I will say, that's why I said compliant because I felt underestimated to be quite frank, because I had a lot of stuff going on in my head. I was actually a really bored in school. I would work really hard and I would train myself to like do what people told me because I was so afraid of the stigma that was associated with getting extra services that I would do everything I could just to fit into the comfort of the norm. Mm -hmm. And so part of, you know, why I do what I do um, and why I think for me and why I share this, because it frames up why I do projects and why I do the work. But part of it is like really making everyone feel like they're seen. They're not underestimated. And it really, for me, my own ability uh, grouping or a disability as a child has really fl- framed up. And I think it's the core of like my own social and racial justice agenda is like, I, you know, as a white woman in America, like there's a lot of <laughs> associations going on with that, but I do know what it feels like to be underestimated, mm-hmm. to like be made to fit, you know, fit a mold that wasn't me. And so part of my like becoming an educator is to really create opportunities and experiences where young people are seen, they're not underestimated, and that the talents that they actually have are valued and appreciated and the multiplicity in which they can show their thinking and their answers and the co of what right. you did with your math, the creativity and the neurodiversity um, that we experience yeah. that's often not appreciated in school. So I say the appreciation of that photo, but there's a lot going on of what a photo can, what we think we, pro- we project out to the world versus what's really going on inside for young people in our schools. Mm. I really want to leapfrog off, to, off that into a question, but I'm also aware that I haven't sort of given everybody listening the opportunity to hear, you know, just a short snippet of, of like what happened from that photo to now, you know, what are some of those key experiences um, or like work, I guess, that shaped like your passions and where you are And Kwaku, maybe I'll start with you. Like, what do you do now? And maybe what's another couple of things from your past that have really collided and catalyzed to create your passions and your interests in the present moment? Sure. Uh, well, so currently, I am the director for the Center of Innovation and Entrepreneurial Thinking at the San Diego Jewish Academy. So um, in addition to holding holding a job title with every single vowel in it, um, I get, I, I, and I was talking about this with Laura prior to this call, I have an amazing job. I get to chase ideas. I get to, um, I, I get to either do personal learning with people like Laura and her team at the D school, or I get to bring in amazing ideas and turn them into projects where I work because I also have pre-K through uh, 12th graders that I, that, uh, that I just have access to. Um, and so I think the thing that shapes a lot of, I guess my perspective of education was or is the fact that I was a music teacher for 10 years and a professional musician for 20 years. And so there's a lot of that that affects every aspect of my job, whether it be the idea of um, understanding how and when to give people moments to shine, to balance out personalities on a team, um, to sort of um, relating and seeing everything from the aspect of teaching something that is not necessarily always taken seriously and isn't factored in as far as like um, as far as like standardized tests, but is also abstract and simultaneously tied to everything else that's taught to a school or taught within a school setting. Mm, that's so interesting. Um, I think I really resonate with that, and and I'm sure we're going to get into this in a moment. But um, I'd love to dig in a little bit further about where you think project-based learning provides, like almost the pedagogical gap to dig into some of those um, maybe parts of the curriculum that are not necessarily lauded as, you know, the must-haves. And, and I think I look at some of those electives and the creative subjects, I think that 
you know, we can appreciate the value and the construct that they contribute to developing a young person. Um, but do you, mm -hmm. do you think that project-based learning is that almost pedagogical vehicle for, for bringing those creative elements and the arts back, back into learning? I do, because if you look at whether you're teaching traditional art or music or uh, some sort of variation of it, what you're typically doing is you're combining all of these skills together. There is so much, once you get into sort of higher level music theory, it's essentially algebra. If you're talking about inversions, that sort of thing. And that is married to poetry. And that is married to this abstract, if, if anybody's familiar with um, uh, synesthesia, the idea of people who see colors when they hear music notes. And so there's so, there's so many connections that can be made across these different disciplines, ironically within these things that we title electives that you elect to take. Um, and so there, there's a really strong connection between that and project-based learning where you're doing a lot of the same things. You're combining all of these different elements. And most importantly, when it comes to playing an instrument, you have to have these moments of struggle before you feel moments of, of feeling comfortable, which is then followed by moments of struggle because you're like, oh, now I'm on the next level of this. And, and what I felt comfortable with now I'm realizing it's just a brand new, there's a whole new floor here that I don't understand. And I feel like there's an aspect of that with PBL as well. And then finally, there's just like the expression, and which is something that Laura mentioned before, the idea of being able to be seen for your strengths within that process. I love that. Laura, let's jump into you and, and tell us a little bit about how did you get to where you are now? What are some of those key, what are you working on now? And maybe what's another couple of things that you've worked on in the past that, that should shape the wealth of experience that you have? Yeah, I mean, I would consider myself an accidental educator, I would say, um, you know, I kind of fell into education, not really sure what I wanted to do when I was 23 years old with a college degree, not in education, um, and looking for something and, you know, started my career as a substitute teacher, actually I spent a year substituting, which will teach you a lot about how to really respect young people and how not to respect young people and creating a culture of respect is, is, a, mutual, is a mutual experience. Um, and yeah, I mean, I started, my first teaching career started on the border of um, San Diego, where clock is fun, um, on the border of San Diego and Mexico. It was, the, it was the high school, literally it was the last high school on the border between the US and Mexico. Um, it was a 3,600 uh, person high school um, and massive number of students and a lot of young people coming across the border every day to take classes. I taught English as a second language. Um, and I taught AP classes and English classes. And that moment uh, for me, I would say, you know, teaching in that environment where it was pretty scripted, I had a lot of ahas in those first couple of years about what I thought education was supposed to be and what I think it could be mm -hmm. um, from scripted material that was given to my English language learners, which was, you know, almost taught at a third grade level when I was dealing with seniors in high school, 12th grade. That I was like not engaging. And I'm like, there's something wrong here. This doesn't seem exciting. What's going on? To looking at the lack of integration that was happening in this massive school, which was pretty diverse. Um, mm. And so I had a lot of ahas actually in my first couple of years of teaching of like, what's the point of this? Is it about taking a test? Is it about really making sure young people are seen? Is it about disrupting tracking based on ability? And there was a lot of formative experiences that I had in that first couple of years of like, no, that's not it. That's can't be it. I remember my third or fourth year, I was tenured at that time, which means I didn't need, ever need to leave my job. They were, I could stay there forever. And I left and gave up that opportunity and um, started and became a founding teacher of a school called High Tech High, which was, you know, grounded as a project-based school. And I think my friend, friend Christine is on this call somewhere who knows me well from projects. Um, and, you know, that school was really grounded in PBL. And it was the first time, hi, Katrina, I can't wait to see you, um, where I had a lot of intellectual freedom where I was treated as a professional that said, where do you want to teach? What are you excited about? what projects do you want to lead with your young people? That's it. Like, what do you want to, and I, I've never, I never experienced that in my other school. It was like, here's the textbook, here's the curriculum, follow this. And, um, that was really scary, <laughs> I will say, and also liberating. And it also shaped up this constant idea of like, 
wow, projects are a vehicle through engagement, curiosity, but they're actually, as much as we talk about them as a vehicle for young people, they are equally important for the educators because through the projects, I got reignited in my own curiosity. What I wanted to learn. I think about, I know Christine on this call, she's got amazing projects. And I know her well enough to know that like she's learning alongside the young people because projects allow you to tap in and kind of check in like what projects are interesting you want to learn about. Um, so yeah, I was there for a really long time, uh, about 15 years or so and became a principal. And then a couple of years ago, I had transitioned and became um, the co-director of the K-12 lab here at the Stanford D School, which is about design and really helping, how do we design um, you know, great work that serves the needs of communities and the needs of young people. And so we spent a lot of time thinking about the levers in K-12 and how we can really experiment with new and radical ways to disrupt inequity in K-12 education. And so we do a lot of projects um, that are grounded in design, but also grounded in what the needs are of uh, young people and the communities. That's awesome, thank you. I wanna um, touch back on something that we mentioned before, Kaki, you talked about like the struggle in project-based learning. And I think it's something that teachers find challenging to move through just as much as young people find challenging to move through. Because if you've got, even if, I mean, it's not about age, it's actually about um, exposure. And if you've got a 17 year old young person that's never tapped into an inquiry-based learning experience, they're just used to be absorbing content and regurgitating it. When you provide them with that inquiry question, that becomes incredibly overwhelming. Um, I'd love to chat about, we, I use the framing like failure fitness, like how we build the ability for our young people to kind of be more fit around failure. How have you done that through your projects? Or what are some of the best examples you've seen of building that value fitness or that productive struggle, maybe for teachers and also for students? I can, well, I can speak for it um, from my perspective uh, initially. I was running a VR club at a school that I was working at and it involved learning C Sharp. And so we're all coming into this. This was 2016, 2017. And this was new and I was given some money to purchase the stuff. And so I said to the kids, all right, cool. We've set this up, I've set up your accounts. We're all going to learn this software together. Here's the first practice assignment. We're gonna take this home. We're gonna come back in. We're gonna talk about it on Monday. I got maybe a third of the way through it. And I come back in on Monday. These kids, they've all, they've all finished it. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I'm married with a small child and you guys have like eight hours to work on this on the weekends because you literally are kids and you have zero responsibility. In no way should I expect that we should be learning this at the same rate. Mm -hmm. And so I had to pivot to from that because I was excited about learning about it and I did get to learn about it, but I got to learn about it through them. And, mm -hmm. I, and, I, and I said to them, you know what? I've been saying, I've been looking at this all wrong. From here on out, you need to tell me what you need and it's my job to get it for, for you and to, you know, give you what you need to sort of keep your, you know, so it was everything from like project management software to occasionally contacting someone on and setting up a Slack channel so that he could give the kids the, the answers to the questions that they were looking for. And that was a huge sort of turning point for me as far as PBL and realizing I don't have to be the expert, but it is also okay to show these kids that I'm struggling with this and that's natural. And so speaking to the point that you, that you made earlier about kids hearing an inquiry question or seeing an inquiry challenge and feeling overwhelmed, uh, the first thing I, I always do is like, man, this is hard. Yeah. And it's really, and, and so I'll fast forward to uh, yesterday, I was having a conversation with a teacher and we're wrapping up this project where kids were building, we had like high school kids building these, like uh, the designing and building these bikes for second graders. And we have kids leaving on a field trip. And the teacher's like, well, we're supposed to do the reveal. And these kids have been putting in all this work. And, and they're not going to get to see the fruits of their labor. And I was like, whoa, slow down. They actually, the work that they're doing, they've got a lion's share of the experience. That is the fruit of the labor. And he's like, actually, you're right. And it's really easy to get caught up in the final piece and not realizing that that, that struggle that you go through to build the thing. And, and all right, this piece works, this piece doesn't. That is actually the meat of it. Mm. Yeah, that's so powerful. Like being able to think about that, almost that pivoting. Um, and I've used the phrase pivot map before. Like if you could actually have each group or each young person almost plot 
on a piece of paper every change decision they make off the yeah. back of feedback or something breaking like that would be the magic of a project-based learning unit not what they've got at the end but how they sought feedback what they did when they got the feedback how the project shifted as a result of the feedback and then also how they go back again right and ask for more feedback and then sort of take that on board mm -hmm. that the beauty of that replicating that feedback loop Laura but what about you and you and I've had lots of chats about this before particularly with educators um, that are super comfortable in a traditional classroom where they're mm -hmm. kind of giving the information and for some of our teachers that might be working in schools where their leadership teams are actually more traditional than they are innovative. How do you build a culture of project-based learning, even just within your classroom, if you've got constraints perhaps outside of that classroom? Yeah, I mean, those are two questions. I'll, I'll Let me respond to the yeah. failure question actually first, because I'm writing a book called My Favorite Failure actually right now. So there's, I have a lot to say about failure. And I, I will like say- I copy straight up. Yeah it's, I'm already... it's, yeah, it's around failure and we've been unpacking failure. And one of the insights that's coming out, and we've been tracking stories of failure called my favorite mm -hmm. failure, people actually would be called learning journey, tracking what they learn and how they felt about it. Mm -hmm. And one of the insights, and I think this is again, how we evaluate project-based learning is the pivots, right? We see that success, that's failure. And I think that's a false narrative because it's really about learning. And we think when something doesn't go well, we lame it, we, whether it's a prototype, a feedback, an exhibition or a project, we label it as failure. And then we associate that actually as an identity. I didn't do this well. And if you are a young person, failure is connected to culture. It's connected to identity. It's connected to race. So there's a lot of stuff to unpack with that. And so one of the things that I think we want to start doing is there is there, this is the learning cycle, which means sometimes you'll, sometimes you will struggle. Sometimes you will get it right the first time. Other times you'll feel better. So one of the things I think we have to play with a little bit about what is, how are we setting up a false narrative of, of sex, successful versus failure versus a learning cycle will require an opportunity for you to have moments of bright insight and moments where you're academically struggling. And that is the process of learning. It's not success or failure. It is the process of learning. And I think the quicker we can actually pull that language out of our narrative the actual more, the understanding, we will be able to change our assessment, right? We will actually have better conversations with our young people and we'll actually like be less afraid of failure because we all have a connotation with failure and failure sucks. It hurts, it feels bad. Everyone has these moments, there's connection to shame, to guilt, to unworthiness that we know about. And, and we associate with learning we think that's learning. Well, no, no, no. Learning is part of the intersection of my work with someone else's, and that is part of the learning process. So I wanted to say that first, because I think there's a lot there we can frame up around learning in not a really like, um, I think, polarizing way. Um, I, particularly before, you, before you dig into the culture question, I'd love to ask how much of that, um, that narrative around failure and what that looks like in the classroom is actually tied to the educators um, comfortableness with failing like yeah. how much how much of those two things tied and how do you move past your own unconscious bias around failure and what that feels yeah. for you in your classroom environment yeah I mean I think it absolutely is because we again as educators if I don't know the answer as Kawaku said and I had a similar experience of like the idea that I have to say I don't know can be seen as a moment of failure for an educator. So there is a mindset shift. And I think there is a moment, there are multiple places within a culture, and we'll get into this question because part of it is an educator's um, openness to the learning journey themselves, mm -hmm. which is the up and downs. Then yeah. there is, how does my community receive my up and downs? One thing we're learning about failure is that failure on its surface feels like an individual act. But actually, if you look at failure moments, it's always in concert with community. If I fail on my own and I'm playing a song that Okwaku's playing and he's a great musician, I don't think he feels a massive sense of failure if he makes a mistake when he's playing on his own. Like, I don't think he's going to like stress out and like have a moment of anxiety and freeze and feel guilt and shame. But if he's on stage and he messes, that's a whole different ball game. So there is this connection between the individual, but then the community's willingness to hold space for folks in the learning journey. 
And that looks very different, you know, and there's lots of ways to think about how you can, one could do that. Um, but I think that's part of it. We assume it's individual, but it is never an individual thing. It is felt individually and it's felt communally. And the question is like, how does every person in that system like really embrace the ups and the downs and what is our responsibility to each other, right? In those moments when we're in the peaks and when we're in these moments where we're of doubt. Sorry, that's can I add something to that? Please do. Yeah. So I love I love that you said that because uh, I have this practice that I go through now. Part of my job is that I work with teachers and I help them to scale out projects that they want to do in their classes. And whenever we start a project, I always tell the teachers, this is a three-year project. You're doing the same thing for the for all three years. This first year, we're just laying the baseline down. You're gonna make a ton of mistakes, which is great. And then all those mistakes, all those things, after you've taught that class, you've gone through that week and you're like, oh, you know what? We should have started this a little bit sooner or they were really into this. You add that to the project plan because next year you're going to come back to it. And I always make the excuse like I'm 70 years old, so I'm not going to remember any of this. Neither will you type this in. Yes, I'm actually 70. I just shea butter. Um, so I'm like, put this in your Google Doc because you're going to come back to this next year. You're going to do the same thing and you want it there. So it's not even just celebrating, it's, it's, it's honoring. It's like, this is an award yeah. because the way, the way Laura framed it, which is beautiful, it's a learning journey. Over those three years, you see this thing take shape. It is not supposed to be perfect the first time around. The experience gets a little bit better each time, but it is about the experience and it is about that journey. It is not about the final product. Yeah, that's so powerful. Um, I also need to get some shea butter as well after that conversation too. Um, can if guys, I want to throw to the floor for some questions as well because I know that I could talk, I could literally talk to these guys for the next like four hours about this stuff. Um, but if you've got a question, feel free to drop it into the chat or um, pop your camera on, and you're you're welcome to sort of take the floor and ask that question. But I'd love it if there's something that you desperately want to dig into. Um, if you could just swing that into the chat, um, and maybe if we can do like a sixty second each. Um, wrap what is the biggest myth about project-based learning like if each of you want to dig into just the 60 second snapshot of what you think the biggest myth or mis misconception around project-based learning is and Laura I'll get you to jump in first and then I mean I think the biggest myth is that we think project-based learning is the pedagogy and I think they think that's the thing. And yet when you're actually running a project-based learning classroom, um, it's never like, oh, well, my kids are working on a project all the time. The best project-based learning classrooms really embed the best, I would say, pedagogical tools that are in service of the projects the young people are doing. So if you're great at Socratic seminars and you're introducing you know, young people to some new concepts, throw a Socratic seminar in or do a critique session Project-based learning is not like, oh, my kids are doing this thing. We are at, it is the weaving, right, of great instructional pedagogies and styles that are in service of the real world of work the students need to be able to produce in the world. And I think that's kind of one of the misnomers. They think it's separate and actually it takes the best of our tools to make a really good project-based learning environment. I love that so much. I think that, you know, the number of times I've had conversations with teachers that are like, well, isn't it just giving them a question? And then you kind of abandon your class for 10 weeks and pop in at the end and go, how'd you go team? Um, and, you know, that, that notion of, you know, framing it around pedagogy for purpose, right? What's the purpose of the learning experience you're creating in this moment? And then what ped pedagogical tools do you need to pull in at that moment in time with those learners? Because you could teach the same project across multiple classes and need entirely different pedagogical tools to reach those learners, depending on their needs. Um, thank you. Kaku, what do you reckon? Like, what's the biggest myth or misconception around project-based learning? Well, Laura kind of stole my answer. I was going to say the paint by numbers <laughs> aspect of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. like if I read this book and I go through this this many times, um, I would also say ignoring the mindset aspect of it. You know, we don't, and I mean, I know we've talked about it as far as teachers, but as far as students as well, mm -hmm. getting them to embrace the idea of it being a journey, not um, aligning it to a, um, a, a different type of unit plan that you're teaching, where it's like, all right, cool. Well, we've talked about this. We've talked about this. We've talked about this. But instead of a test, well, we've talked about it. Now you're going to produce a project, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Um, but speaking more to the point that I think both of you raised, the idea one, what Laura said about it not being a pedagogy, but Nicole, this thing that you, you just mentioned, um, if you're really doing this well, there's a lot of holding up mirrors mm -hmm. because you're trying to not only um, reflect the culture of your school, but you're also, or your school, your classroom, your school, you're also trying to get students to see what their strengths are and how that can be applied to this process. And so, I mean, that, that part, feeling that you need to lead more than you need to sit back, reflect, you definitely need to guide, you put the bumpers and, you know, this is a bullying analogy, but, you know, you have the bumpers, so you can't pull a gutter ball, you have to create the parameters so that the students are moving in a direction, but you also have to create that space for them, for them to struggle. And then also be like, you know what, I do this part really well, or even, even if they aren't in that place, I enjoyed this aspect of it, and then building in that reflection time. Mm. I um I often joke when people ask about our programs, like, oh, kids must love um, engaging in youth enterprise. And my comment is like, yeah, some kids do, they love it, and other kids hate it. And I, I just hope that whatever curriculum I'm involved in, it polarizes young people. I don't ever want it to be beige. My greatest fear would be a young person cruising through a learning experience with, without having an opinion either way about what they liked or what they didn't like, what they found hard or what they found easy. Um, I think if it polarizes a young person and an educator, it means we're learning something about ourselves. And that's kind of the purpose of, of learning and of teaching and of education um, from a lifelong point of view. Melly's got a question here that I wanna jump into and I'm conscious of time, but um, I think we could talk for ages. This is a big one that we have certainly around like the standardized testing that appears in the senior schooling particularly and also the rigor that exists in our junior school but how do you implement PBL effectively when time is so limited in order to cover the content? Um, you know what does that look like for an educator who perhaps yeah ha has to cover the content but wants to bring this lens to their classroom experience? Kwaku I might start with you for this one and then I'll head to Laura. So that's interesting, uh, especially now. In, well, and Laura and I were talking about this earlier. Our experience here in the States with COVID is vastly different than the experience that most of the people on this call in Australia are having. Um, and so as a result, uh, and Laura will probably speak to this as well, we've lost concept of time. It, it's, it's not even a thing for us anymore because we're all exhausted and we're all constantly working, you know, and, and part of that is just like some weird American ideals that we've all been brought up with. But um, one thing that I would bring up, we, I think as teachers, we put this on us, like we have this much time to get through this material. And so I, maybe I would use the analogy of like, you know, making a sweater or something. Um, you have, and maybe you're making a sweater with a bunch of different colors in it. And if you have different colors in different sections, you have the ability to, all right, I'm going to sew this sleeve and this sleeve is going to be red. This sleeve is going to be blue. The bottom of this is going to be green, or I'm going to blend these colors in. The nice thing about PBL and which we talked about earlier is that you actually touch on a lot of different disciplines at the same time. And so what feels like, well, how do I fit this in when I have to make sure that I cover all these units might be a different approach. And every school is different. I've worked in schools where, they're, where they say from top down, today is this date, at this time, you need to literally be saying X. That's a hard scenario. That is really hard to be like, all right, cool. I know I'm supposed to be saying X, but I'm gonna sneak this in. And this, this goes back to like, how are you reflecting your school community? with your practice, because it's not paint by numbers. But if you have a modicum of freedom, meaning, all right, throughout this semester, we know we have to cover these things. The amount of time that you would put in to sort of um, finding ways to blend those different topics through PBL would not only save you time, but also be more meaningful as an experience for you and your students. Mm -hmm. And I know that's a really high level answer, but um, not having a full sense of, of the school setting, it's hard for me to be more specific. Mm. Yeah, and I can definitely provide a, provide a contextual response in a second, but Laura, I'd love to get your insights on this one because I think Alyssa speaks to this as well. And I know we've chatted about this before, like how you align, if your school's got really particular rubrics and marking criteria, um, mm -hmm. and how you align that with maybe a more innovative or project-based like lens on assessment. 
Yeah, I mean, the assessment question is a really important one. Um, and I can speak a lot about that of like, what are we assessing for? I mean, I think, mm. I think there's a, I would agree with Kwaku, like there's a weaving of content that you can bring yeah. into projects. I also would say it's really important to like, not everything has to be a project, you know, like give yourself that freedom. Like you do a pro project a quarter, or whatever, like make it small, do it a week. You know, I took a, a unit, my first project was taking a, like a lesson that I had done every year for ninth graders. And I switched it into like having them make vignettes. The content was the same. The output was slightly different, you know? And so like, give yourself a break and do something that's like maybe a week. It doesn't have to be a full semester and keep it relatively smaller than maybe, especially when you're just starting out. I think that's really important. Um, and just think about what are those moments at the end. And then the other thing that's really important is Kuwaku I'll highlight too, is that if we're doing projects, it's also the responsibility of the designer, the teachers to document those learning standards. You know, no one's going to say you didn't cover all this, you covered all the standards if you don't show them how you did it. And so I think as anyone who's thinking about innovation or PBL and different types of pedagogy you're bringing into school, it is kind of our responsibility to, um, who are, is in the vanguard, if you will, like on the cutting edge to show how we're doing this work. It's actually just a responsibility to our communities of like, here's the project, here's all the learning standards we covered and let me show you how I did it. And I think that's just, that, that's helpful to others. It's helpful for her own thinking. And I think it actually builds a stronger um, basis for project-based learning across this community that we have. And what are those projects and can you get them out there in the world? Um, and then with the assessment, I mean, that's a sticky one. I think that, you know, the question, I would always argue, I think that like we do know, I will say just from recent studies that have come out, um, particularly on project-based learning is that the question I would say partly is like, what do we really, what really matters when it comes to assessment? You know, there are recent studies that have come out, particularly from the George Lucas Foundation recently, that students who experience project-based learning actually matriculate through university at higher rates than students who do not. That's a longitudinal study it was just produced this past month. Um, so they're seeing that data. So part of it is, is like really understanding what's the data that really matters and having a, a bold conversation about what are we really about? And that takes bravery, that takes courage, and it takes time to get there. Um, and then the second thing I think is really important is like, how can you co-construct these assessments, these markings with your young people to really understand what are you trying to learn? What are they trying to be held accountable to? And how can we actually co-construct assessment? Not just mark them, but how are they involved in the assessment process? And can they be? And the more you can do that, the more clarity we have on our expectations and accountability, but there is an insight to like, what are we really assessing? <laughs> What's really coming through? And actually are we marking or are we actually documenting the reflection journey? And those are two different questions. Um, there's a lot to say in that, but uh, we could probably spend another hour talking about assessment. <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree. And I think um, you both probably touched on something that I think is really powerful um, is probably taking the pressure off the educator to do it all with every piece of curriculum. You know, there are going to be some units of curriculum that should not be integrated. It shouldn't be cross curricular. Don't try and if, if it doesn't feel right, it probably isn't right. Um, there are going to be some units where the assessment task can't be molded to be a um, a showcase element or a project and and that's okay too but there are often micro opportunities within the learning journey to transform what might have been quite a linear experience of taking information and regurgitating it and transforming it into a discovery moment where young people can play with the content and actually investigate and um, stand up and pitch and and really learn through that hands-on approach. And so, I, you know, I think that for educators that are sitting in a system or a school or a culture that's quite rigorous, if there are places within that curriculum stream that you can't play, look for the micro moments in the learning journey for you to open up opportunities for the young people that are sitting in front of you. I think that can be really powerful as well. Um, I'm conscious of time, and I know that we could talk to these guys for, for hours, um, ultimately. But I, I guess I just want to say a quick thank you to you both. I know it's like a midnight where you are right now. So you've carved out time late at night to join us in Australia and share some of your experiences with us. So on behalf of me, the Future Anything team, those that are joining us live and the other hundred or so educators that have registered to see the recording, I just want to say thank you for both your experiences. And maybe if we could finish with, if you have one piece of advice to give to an educator who would like to, maybe a piece of advice or maybe a resource that they could access to know more or to get across something, what would be that one piece of advice or that one resource that you would sort of want them to connect to? 
Laura, do you want to go first? Oh, we're so polite. That... Parker, you can go first. <laughs> you've got the mic off. Like, you got the floor, sir. So. <laughs> I know. I, I, anyway, okay. Um, Laura just said something that was really interesting, the idea of which I, you know, okay, I'm going to back up and this is, this isn't going to be short, but I'm going to try to make it as short as possible. I usually do two things when I'm working with teachers who are new to PBL. One, I say to them, you've taught a unit or you've taught, you know, you've taught this class for a certain number of years. What is the thing you struggle teaching? The thing where it always feels like oh, they, the kids never quite get it when I do it this way. That's usually where I start because at this point you've tried this you've tried something this traditional way, you feel that you've had, you have this down, but you always feel like you're missing in a way. You never quite get that, that aha moment or that connection with kids because that always feels like the right place to start. If you're doing something well and you're getting the results, why reinvent the wheel? Um, so I would say that. And then the other piece that Laura brought up, which was um, the idea of involving kids with the, uh, within the assessment piece. Um, that is something that I think is really, really huge. As a teacher, you know, whether it is something, something that where you've, whether you've taught it so much, I need, I need to understand that they know these pieces or your school or your district is saying, these are the standards kids need to, need to hit. You can start from that point. You can have that conversation and backwards design, but most importantly, make it visible to them. Make them part of the conversation like, oh yeah, that is a four or that is an A or whatever it is. That's close. Maybe we'll call this B. You're leading this conversation, but you know what it is and you're letting them into that insight. And it's a common agreement so that when, when they're bringing something to you, you're not the one who's judging it. They're judging it based upon the conversation that you've had with them. You'd be like, well, all right, this, this looks okay to me, but does it look like it matches what we had our conversation about? Does it hit all of those standards? And if it does, then tell me why. And ideally, they haven't hit it, but in that explanation, that gets them to that point. And I feel like, like Laura saying, we could literally talk about this for hours, so I'm going to stop talking now. Laura, it's your turn. <laughs> and then, yeah, I you know Katrina is a great teacher on this call, Katrina Expert. I'll just shout her out because she's in the community. She's done some epic projects that are cross-disciplinary, that engages math, science, and art. And I know she's got a, probably a lot of stuff on her website that she could share that aligns directly, particularly, I think she's still in Adelaide to like curriculum. So I think it's, you know, maybe she can share some of her work. Uh, yes, Katrina, thank you. She's got some <laughs> really amazing work. Um, I know her from experience. And then I dropped in a few models of projects um, as examples. I think all of everything Kwaku said, of course. And I think, I mean, there's also a piece that I think is really important um, around becoming a project-based kind of a lessons or wisdom, if you will, is really embrace the ambiguity of it. Mm -hmm. You know, project-based learning is a dispositional shift and it requires us to go into this place where we're like kind of a little anxious, is a little unknown. And I think that um, that's an okay thing to have. You know, we are living in a world with rapid change. Our situation here in the United States is very different than what's going on. And ambiguity, I think is something that as educators, we don't talk about enough of. We actually scaffold out ambiguity in our work, which I think is a disservice to our young people. And so I think what projects does is it allows people to wrestle, wrestle with questions they don't know the answer to. Questions you can't look up in a textbook. And if we are actually going to create a future of anything, right, where this started, then part of embracing that concept of really doing great work is actually about embracing, I don't know, this ambiguity of uncertainty and being the facilitator um, of those moments of ambiguity. And that I think is the secret sauce. That's an important piece because you can have a project guide, you can have a plan, you can have a partner in your project, you can have a curation plan, you can have all that stuff. And yet you can actually feel like you're entering into a, a quicksand where the, where the next step feels uncertain. The next thing you do doesn't feel right. And I think really naming that this is where we are in this work. This is an ambiguous process. It's gonna feel funky. There's going to be moments where you feel like you got it. And then moments you feel like you've taken two steps back. And that is actually a skill for the future. We need to have these opportunities for our young people, because if they are going to change the world, and I hope they do, and they're going to shape the world that we all want, they're going to have to lean into lots of moments of ambiguity. 
Yeah, I um, I couldn't agree more. Thank you to you both. And and I think um, whilst we encourage our young people to, to lean into those moments of ambiguity, like our teachers also need to be comfortable with sitting in that from a professional practice point of view and also watching that happen with the young people that are in the classroom. I think one of the hardest things to do as an educator, you know, when we often go into this profession as a vocation to support and coach and, and grow the abilities of young people, um, one of the most powerful things that we can do is actually to step back instead of step forward um, when a young person's about to fall. Because if we catch them um, before they fail, we actually rob them of the learning experience in, in what to do when they fall down. Um, and so when you see your young people struggling, if, and particularly in a collaborative work, if there's a group that's not working, um, if there's a task that doesn't look like it's going to get finished, um, you know, the one thing that I would leave you with is to actually ask questions and take a big breath and step back from that moment and, um, and scaffold the experience for your young people, but don't rob them of that failure because that's actually what will help them learn not to repeat that in the future. So thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Um, there's a whole bunch of like links in the chat um, that these guys have dropped in and other educators have dropped in. If there's a resource that you use, please drop it in. Um, what we'll do after this is we'll actually package this back so you can rewatch all of this gold again for everyone, but we'll also make sure that all the resources um, that are mentioned in this comment bank are actually shot out to you as well so that you have those. So don't stress if you're frantically trying to copy and paste, we'll make sure that you get all of those links too. Um, and the final thing that I just want to finish off before we close is actually when we have our next um, conversation. So we've got our live learning session for April um, lined up with some pretty epic humans um, coming up for this one as well. And we're kind of building on the conversation that we've already started with today. Um, so we're going to be talking next generation STEM um, and basically moving beyond the tech because I think STEM and STEAM are often interlinked with technology and coding and robots and, and actually what we want to look at um, in our next conversation on the 29th of April and you can um, jump into that one is how we move beyond tech and actually look at the skills and dispositions that our young people need to navigate some of those future careers and opportunities around STEM. Um, so on behalf of me and the Future Anything team, thank you so much. And my challenge to you is how are you and your young people going to bend the future? Well, thank you all.